Well, let's get into the message. Are you ready for a church? Christmas season. As I said, Christmas is not a day, it's, it's actually a season. There's so many events that happen around it. And uh, so they, in traditional churches, tend to call this time of the year Advent. Um, the Advent season is not a word that we use a lot, um, but it means simply this, the arrival of a notable person. It means a t- it's a time of preparation and expectation. And as I've said every week when I've introduced this, our culture is prepared for Christmas for whole different reasons but how many of you know our culture prepares for Christmas because it's all about the shopping it's all about the spending and uh, how much more should Jesus followers be prepared for Christmas because of what it actually represents to each one of us yes and so we've been looking at a number of ways in which we can prepare and what we can expect we talk about the fact first week we talked about the fact that joy can happen here not because of what is happening because for some Um, they're going through things in their life that don't bring them joy whatsoever, but joy can happen here not because of what is happening, but because of what has happened and because Jesus came and uh, Jesus came on a mission to save us and it was successful. How many of you have ever seen somebody who's been rescued who's been, you know, lost in the bush or whatever, and that helicopter comes over the top and they say, how many of you have ever seen an unhappy person being rescued? It's like, joyful, joyful, right? And that's us. That's you and me this morning. We've been saved, but not only is there joy for the ones being saved, but there's joy for the ones that have done the saving. And so when not we can experience the joy of being saved, but then when we join with Jesus in the mission of saving others, we too can not only have joy, but we can have, as the Bible says, Jesus called it fullness of joy. And so that's what we talked about the first week. Then we talked about last light. We talked about light, how we can expect light because Jesus is the light of the world. Light illuminates, shows us the way forward. It cleanses, it heals, and it grows. You can hear those on our podcast, on our on the YouTube channel. So today, though, I want to talk about what I believe is the greatest Christmas theme of all. Big claim, but I believe it is. It's the greatest theme of all. In fact, it's the most, I would say, the most important theme of all when it comes to Christmas. In fact, Christmas is so much about this, um, this theme that I'm going to talk about this morning that they actually gave Jesus, because of it, they actually, they gave Jesus a nickname. A nickname, I'll say that in italics. Uh, Everyone understands what a nickname is. Um, a nickname is a name that you give someone, um, usually it's linked to a characteristic of that person. For instance, my best friends who I grew up with and, and we shared a, a unit with for a while in our early apprenticeship years, um, one of them was Neil, he was really smart, his nickname was Brain. They never call me that, but that's another story. His brother Greg, uh, his nickname was Peck. You made the connection? Gregory Peck. Come on, help us out. So it's in relation to his name. Um, you know, or, or they, what are the Aussies called redheads? Blueies. <laughs> Has anyone ever heard that? I say, I had a, I had a nickname. And now, um, prior to surgery um, in my life, I, I had a reasonable size snoz, reasonable nose, and it had been broken a number of times. I had corrective surgery a number of years ago to straighten it out and fix it up. But my nickname right through... Uh, my teenage years and my apprenticeship years, my early plumbing years, was Gonzo. How disrespectful. Um, Gonzo, off the, you know, yeah, you got the picture. Just forget the picture anyway. uh, So thank you. Everyone said thank you, Pastor Gonzo. There you go. Well, there's a name that they call Jesus, and it's because of a characteristic. It's because of what he represented, and and I'm sure you'll soon figure out what it is. But Matthew Chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, give us an insight as to what this is about. In verse 21, this is the, uh, the angel speaking to Mary. says, she will give birth to a son, and you are, you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill. I went back a bit far. Here we go. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child... 
and will give birth to a son and they will call him. His name will be Jesus, but they will call him what? Emmanuel. God, which means God with us. Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. His name was Jesus, but they called him Emmanuel. Did you see that? Because his name means Emmanuel, which because he is God with us. God with us. This is, I believe, the most important theme of Christmas. These three words are weightier than the world. God with us. This is what Christmas is all about. It's about God becoming human. The theological term we use for it is the word incarnation. God becoming one of us. God becoming flesh. Incarnating himself to become one of us. The creator becoming one of his creations. Emmanuel. Come on, say it with me. God with us. You know, this sentence has appeared in a lot of unusual places because a lot of people like to claim that God is with them. Who doesn't want to have God with them? In fact, um, in here I've got um, something that may interest some of you. Um, uncle Bob was my uncle, great uncle. He was a World War I veteran. And uh, this is Uncle Bob's bayonet. And it's actually a German bayonet. Nasty. But on the buckle on the belt, which is dropped off it, is these three words inscribed. Gott mit und. Gott mit und. What does that mean? God with us in German. Because how many of you know in a situation like that, you want to think that God is with you, right? And so it's, it's a word and a, a thought that a lot of people have thought and make people lay claim to. So this morning, I want to actually just unpack a little bit what God with us means. And I simply want to look at it in these three words, God, God with, and God with us. And then look at some of the practical implications that, that might have in our life. Firstly, God. Jesus is God. Let me say that again. Jesus is God. This is, this is the most important part of Christmas. It's the most important part. Everything about Christmas is secondary to this. Peace, joy, hope, love, all of the other themes of Christmas are secondary to the fact that Jesus is God. Because those things are actually only possible because Jesus is God. Now, Scripture is full of this message. Claims of Jesus being God. It's a constant theme through the New Testament. The disciples were totally convinced. The disciples believed this. They believed that Jesus was not just a good man. They believed that Jesus was not just a prophet. They believed that Jesus just wasn't a miracle worker. They believed that Jesus was God in the flesh. They believed that he was the Son of God. Thomas, when he put his fingers in the, in the, in the scars in the hands of Jesus and, and the scars in the spear in his side, he said, My Lord and my God. The disciples, on numerous occasions, worshipped him. They worshipped him as a deity in, in the storm. When Jesus comes walking out to the disciples, they're in the boat, they think they're going to drown. Jesus comes walking out on the water, uh, and at first they're afraid, but then when, when they recognized it was Jesus, that they, they knelt down and they worshipped, and they said, My Lord, my, you truly are the Son of God. And they worshipped him. The disciples believed it. Now, we say that, can I just make a point this morning, that that is within itself absolutely amazing and unlikely. That first century Jews would believe that a human being, flesh and blood, which they had lived with, that flesh and blood could actually be God. That was an amazing thought. You see, these, these people, this, these Jews, these Jewish people were not pantheists. Pantheists believe that God is in everything. God is in the tree. God is in the 
flowers. God is in this. They, they believe that they weren't pantheists, and nor were they polytheists. Poly, polytheists. <laughs> it's a hard word to say, isn't it? Uh, polytheists believe that the Greeks and the Romans were polytheists. They, they believe that um, God could, gods could come down in actual human flesh. In fact, we've got an instance in Acts, um, in Acts chapter 14. Um, he, this gives you an example. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lake, Lake, Lake Ionian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Read on. Barnabas they called Zeus. <laughs> There's a nickname. And Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priests of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowds wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostle, apostles Barnabas Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and rushed into the crowd, shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from those worthless things to the living God, and on and on and on and on. So it was quite common for the Romans and the Greeks to believe that gods can come down in human form. So pantheists or polytheists, that, that, was, a, that was quite feasible that they would believe that, but not first century Jews. They believed in the God of the Old Testament. They believed that God was uncreated, that God was the creator. You see, they, they, they believed that he was the creator of the universe who had no beginning nor end. He was all-powerful, he was almighty, he was preeminent. So the last people actually on planet earth that would believe a human could be God would have been those Jewish people. Now, sure, they, they were looking for a Messiah, but a Messiah was not to, that, that, that was, that's a totally different thing to looking to someone to worship as a God. I guess another point which kind of highlights this is that Jesus lived with them. He, he was like family. They, they spent so much time together. Now, I can tell you the last person, if I was trying to convince anybody that I was God, the last person that would ever believe me would be my family. That's why one of, the, one of the incredible proofs of Jesus being the Son of God, being God in the flesh, is that James, the brother of Jesus, actually believed that Jesus was God. So if you can convince your family that you're God, I tell you, you you've, got to be, you've got to be the real deal for your family to believe you, right? Absolutely. And so this is an amazing thing, that they actually worshipped Him as God. In fact, those disciples they so believed it that they died for that belief they believed that just you need to look through a filter to look at the sun that they were looking at God through the filter of human nature the disciples absolutely believed he was God Paul believed it in Colossians he talks he talks about Jesus all things being created by him and then in 1 Colossians 1 19 he said for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him who's him Jesus Paul believed it Jesus claimed it in John 8 you read about he's talking about uh, someone mentioned Abraham and, and, Je and Jesus says to the Pharisees who were listening they said hey Abraham rejoiced at seeing my day and they went what how would you know what Abraham was going to rejoice. How would you even know who, you don't know Abraham. And Jesus then says this, he said, before Abraham, was, before Abraham was born, I was. Before Abraham was born, I was. And we know what they thought he was claiming and what they thought he was actually saying by their response. They picked up stones to stone him because that was blasphemy to be claiming to be God. So Jesus claimed to be God. You see, there's not a single attribute of God not in Jesus. Jesus is fully God, and God is fully in Christ. Let me, know, let me tell you this morning, Jesus did not begin in a manger. Jesus existed before creation. He was the first baby born to be so much older than his parents. You getting this this morning? Jesus is God, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail incarnate, 
deity. You hearing me this morning? Now I'm going to tell you why that's important in a moment, but firstly, Jesus was God. Are we clear on that this morning? There's so much more we could open and talk about, but I've said enough. So Jesus is God. So God, what's the next word? With. Jesus is God and Jesus is God with us. With us. This is amazing. This whole concept of with is amazing when we take a moment and remember what I just said, that Jesus is God. He's the all-powerful. He's the almighty. He's the omnipotent. He's the eternal God. And he's with us. Now, in previous times when, this, when God manifested himself, um, it was quite a different scenario. He, there was a burning bush. Who was that to? Moses. There was the hot coal. There was limping Jacob. There was Uzza reaching out to steady the Ark of the Covenant, which housed the presence of God, yeah, and becomes struck dead. Um, there's a tornado. That's the way God manifest himself to Job. And I, I haven't actually seen a tornado for real, but I, I've seen them on telly, and I tell you, that's pretty terrifying, right? Uh, he he identified, uh, come as a smoking furnace. Not quite sure what that is, but it was Abraham. Abraham and the smoking furnace. God appeared as a smoking furnace that moved between the animals that he had sacrificed. Um, there was a pillar of fire. There was, when he appeared in the, the presence in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, it was the Shekinah cloud in the temple and no one could go in because if they did they would surely die if they hadn't purified and sanctified and everything that needed to happen before they went in and so you know, whenever God appeared the first thing that was always usually said was like fear not who knows that to be true this morning Moses Moses said he, he wanted to see God he said I want to see you God I want to see your glory and God said, you can't see, if you see my face, you would surely die. So I'm going to put you in the cleft of a rock. I'm going to put you in a crack in the rock and I'm going to pass by. And when I've gone past, you can look out and you can just see my hindquarters. I don't even want to begin to describe what that could possibly be. But Moses looked out and he saw just the hindquarters of a God going past. And then when Moses come down off the mountain, such was the effect upon his life. So radiant was his face that the crowd recoiled in fear and they had to put a veil over his face from God from Moses just seeing the hind quarters of God wow so that's that's it. can you imagine if Moses could be here for this imagine for Moses to be here for this and it's like Moses and, and they start reading the Christmas story Moses would you know imagine John 1 14 what's John 1 14 say the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us and then, and then John makes this claim. Can you imagine Moses' shock? We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son. And Moses going, that's what I was deprived. That's what I couldn't get to do. You seriously? Do you realize what you're dealing with here? Do you understand that what, what this actually means? That the almighty, magnificent, eternal, everlasting, omnipotent, all-powerful God is with us? Really? Can you imagine Moses' shock and his excitement and his envy all at once? As he, people, do you understand this is God with? God with. What a privilege. What a privilege. Paul says in Corinthians that Moses saw God veiled, but through Jesus the veil is removed. We can have God with us. We can experience him in ways that Moses never could. You and I can meet God. John says, I've seen his glory. So he's not just God. Jesus is not just God, but he's God with. Anybody think that's pretty cool this morning? He's God with. What's the third word? Us. God with us. God with us. God with me. You see, Christmas is not about my journey 
to God. Did you hear what I just said? Christmas is not about my journey to God. Christmas is about God's journey to us. Us. The God I described earlier of the fire and the tornado, that sounds a little intimidating. But God became one of us. The incarnation, incarnated God. Remember my brother, <clears throat> about six years older than me, was um, heading to work one morning. We lived in country, country Victoria and... Um, he saw it playing on the side of the road. There was a little fox cub, cute little fox cub. And he stopped the car real quick, jumped out, and he managed to catch it. And he brought it home. And so we had a, we, illegal, I know, we're farmers, hey. We had a pet fox, a little fox cub. And it wasn't, it, was, it wasn't like teeny teeny, so we didn't rear it and didn't feed it, you know, didn't off the milk bottle and all that sort of thing, which we'd done with other animals. This was a little bit bigger, but we could never get near that fox. No matter how long we had it, no matter what we did, we just could not tame it. And it would always be fearful when we'd come near it. It would always get in the back of its little kennel we had for it and hide away. And no matter how much I tried... My brother tried, or any of us tried. My mum, my mum was brilliant with animals, but we just could not get that thing to trust us and stop to be stop being afraid. The only way that we could have made that happen was if we could become foxes. Now my name is Russell, and Russell does mean red fox. Is that right? So I don't know where that come from. I don't know what my parents were thinking when they named me, but red fox. Um, I can't become a fox, right? But if I could, how many of you know that I could approach that and it wouldn't be afraid? The only way to remove the fear barrier, well, that's what Jesus did with us. The only way he could remove the fear barrier was to become one of us. What could be, what could be more approachable than a baby? Well, you might argue with that one, I know, but there you go. But what, what could be less fearful? What could be more approachable than a baby in a manger? Wow. Wow. So God with us. Isn't that wonderful? So let's just for a minute think about what that means for us. What can we expect? Because Emmanuel, God with us, what can we expect? What can we prepare ourselves for? Well, firstly, <clears throat> we can expect pardon for our sins we can expect pardon for our sin why because jesus is god if jesus wasn't god he cannot forgive us or save us from our sins what do you mean well if um 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 um, um trying to let me who can i pick on if if Russell, sorry, if Russell, is Russell here? No? Okay, well, there's, there's two Russells. Okay, Russell, there he is, there he is, okay. If Kevin punched Russell on the nose, firstly, that would be most unexpected because Kevin's a, a pacifist, aren't you, Kevin? If Kevin punched Russell on the nose and then I say... Kevin, I forgive you. You'd go, who do you think you are forgiving Kevin for that? The only person that can forgive Kevin is who? Russell. You're with that. Who can, who can see that? So why? Because the sin was against Russell. So only Russell can forgive it, yes? Make sense? Right, now, when Jesus healed the paralytic... The paralyzed man, not that sort of paralytic, he was paralytic. Jesus healed the paralytic. 
He heals him, then he says this. He says, go and what? Your sins are forgiven. He says, your sins are forgiven. How could he say that? How could he say that? Because they said, how can you even say that? Only God can forgive sin. Well, the reason why Jesus could say your sins are forgiven is because every sin was actually against him. Because he was God. Does that make sense? Because Jesus is God. Every sin was against him. Why? Because he's God, the creator. And where he's creation, when we sin, we sin against our creator. And that's Jesus. Who believes that? And that's why people were offended with Jesus, because he said, your sins are forgiven. Why? Because only God could forgive sin. And that's why Jesus' death on the cross on the cross could pay the price for your and my sin. Paid in full is written over our life. You can be assured today that when you confess your sin, that God is faithful and just and will cleanse you of all unrighteousness because of Jesus, because of God with us, because all sin is against him and Jesus was God. And so Jesus, can, he paid the penalty in full on the cross and you can be sure today that your sin is forgiven. How good is that? How good is that? You need to remember that. You're going to need it. Today. In the car park on the way out. <laughs> but all jokes aside, we, we rely on that. You and I need that. Come on, you bunch of holy people. So you can be assured your sins are forgiven. You can expect that. Secondly, Jesus becomes personal. Jesus becomes personal. God is with us. He's with us. And the word with, can I put it in these terms, the withness, <laughs> the withness of God, with is the most, it, with us, it means with us in the most personal and loving way. Now, this is the most important thing I want to say this morning, I think. So, I, may, I hope I can explain it clearly this morning. You see, the fact that God is with us, it becomes personal. And, and it's not just an experience, uh, it, it, it's more than an experience. It's something that's very personal and, and, and intimate. Um, I remember years ago, um, I did a funeral in this building and uh, it was a man who come to this church. He was a horse trainer, hadn't been a Christian that long, um, and then suddenly took ill, and unfortunately he died. So I did the funeral. So the the, the place was filled. He was a well known horse trainer. The place was filled with racing identities and people from the racing world. And I stand up to do the funeral. I look down and sitting about where you are uh, is Lee Matthews. Who's Lee Matthews? They say. Lee Matthews was the coach of the Brisbane Lions with their three-peat back when they got three grand finals in a row. But he was also, he's the, he's, there's a bronze statue of him outside the MCG in Melbourne. He's a Hawthorne great. Now you're starting to get it. Now you're impressed, aren't you? He's, he's, like, he's considered to be the, player, the best player ever. Um, some would argue that, but he's like, you know, and so here's Lee Matthews, my childhood hero, and he was, and I'm a Hawthorne supporter, I've got a picture of the Hawth in my, Hawks in my phone, and here's Lee Matthews, oh, can I tell you for a moment, I got a little bit starstruck, I went a little bit, Woo! Geordie was laughing at me, because he could see me sort of go, <laughs> it's Lee Matthews, I couldn't believe it, and so, um, I did the funeral, and so I, I, I experienced Lee Matthews. I was in the same room as Lee Matthews. I had an experience of Lee Matthews being in the room that I was in, right? But afterwards, I, I approached him very carefully, showing him my phone as I walked up. <coughs> and he was very magnanimous. He was very warm. He was very welcoming, as you expect any Hawthorne person would be. And uh, he invited me to come and have coffee and they were having a wake afterwards with about, about a dozen of them, and he invited me to come and be a part of that. And I spent the next two or three hours conversing and talking to Lee about his footy career and about his coaching and about his TV 
whatever, and then he was asking us about the church, and, you know, he was asking about the whole service. Um, but how many know, suddenly it went from something that just was an experience, it was something that was a lot more personal than that. I could literally then say, I was with Lee Matthews. I could say I was with Lee Matthews, along with all the others, but then I was with him. Can you make sense? And so when Jesus said, it suddenly become personal. And so when it says God with us, it's something that becomes incredibly personal. Now let me help you get how significant that is. In John 1, we talked about this last week, but in the beginning was the Word, John 1, 1 and 2, if you can just pop that up. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who's the Word? Who's it talking about? It's Jesus. Later on it says, and you know, He was the firstborn, etc., etc. It's clearly Jesus. In the beginning was, He was with, He was, <laughs> leave it on there. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was with God, so Jesus was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus was with God and he was God. You following this? Right? Verse 2, um, he was with God in the beginning, meaning he wasn't created. Right? He's the, uncre- he's the creator. He was with God in the beginning. Is everyone with me? Right. So when it says with God, it's a word, the word with means he was in a relationship with God. When he says he chose the 12 to be with them, that's what he means. He, was, he, was, he chose the 12 to be in relationship with them, to, to love them, to, be, to do life with them. Are you following this? So John 1 is saying this. There's only one God. Jesus is God. And Jesus is in a relationship with God. Are you confused? It's called the Trinity. That's why... The Bible says there's one God, it teaches us clearly that there's God the Father. The Holy Spirit is not mentioned here, but the Holy Spirit is mentioned in many other occasions. So there's one God with three persons, God the Father, God the, and God the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing, they know and love each other from the beginning, if they were before, because they were not created, they have for all time, they have known and they have loved and been in relationship with one another. Okay? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have known and loved each other. Can I just say, inside the Godhead, the best as I could describe it as the Word of God reveals to us, is that there's a dynamic, there's an there's a overflow, overflowing, loving, glorifying, serving adoring each other relationship the father and the son and the holy spirit and that ladies and gentlemen is why the meaning of life is relationship and love that's why so and that's been like that from the beginning that's the godhead now, if God was just one God, if he was one personality, if he was one entity, he'd be a God of power, right? Power would be first. And then in order to have love, he would have to create something, right? For love to have an expression, yes? Right? So if he created something, then, and then if he was firstly just one, one entity, and then he created something, well, power would have been first, and then love would have happened, But no, God is not that. Because God has been together, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, when it says God is love, the Bible describes him, it says God is love. We go, all right, God is loving. No, it's more literal than that. God is literally love. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In a dynamic, intimate, loving relationship, serving, giving, glorifying one another throughout eternity. You with me? So before he created anything, God just didn't love because he created us. Before God created anything, he was loving. He was love. You follow me? He was love. And that's why in John 1.18, listen what it describes. It describes Jesus. It says, no man has seen God 
at any time, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. That's a term of intimacy and closeness. Who can see that? Ma- imagine how many people, that's a term of like snuggling right up. There's a, it's, a, it's a real term of intimacy, close intimacy. Can you imagine how many people in this world that you would know that could lie up beside you like that? Very few. Just those that are the most intimate, the most loving people in your life. Unless you're sitting on a plane and they fall asleep on you. and That's another whole story. Now, hang with me. Imagine the time in your life when you felt most loved. Imagine just for a moment the time in your life where, where and when you felt most loved. Now multiply that by a million. That's God. Right now, even in a good marriage, those moments of love can come and they can go. Right, even in a good marriage. Now, imagine instead three persons, perfect persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, always loving, glorifying, giving, serving throughout all eternity. That's God. Now, why did God create beings in his image? Remember, he was love. He created beings in his image, listen to me carefully, to share in that, to experience that love, to experience with each other and to experience it with God. I don't know if I've done a great job in explaining that this morning, but how personal is that? You can never go through a day wondering if God loves you. Because God is love. So it becomes incredibly personal. So because Jesus is God with us, we can be sure our sins are forgiven and his relationship with you becomes incredibly personal and incredibly loving. He absolutely loves you more than you and I will ever, ever know. Time's gone. There's one more thing. I'll just give it to you really brief. You can expect forgiveness, pardon from sin. You can expect it to be personal. I think that's still landing on us, right? But you can also expect his presence. His presence. Can I have the team up, please? And I've written down a number of situations in life where you can expect his presence now because he's God with us. And I'll just give them to you real quick. You can expect his presence when you're lonely. A lot of lonely people at Christmas time. For a lot, it's great. For a lot, it's not. Loneliness is magnified. Hebrews, Jesus says he's going to, Paul, the writer of Hebrews says that, talking of Jesus, that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Who believes that this morning? You can expect his presence when you're lonely. You can expect his presence when you're tempted. When you're tempted. Oh, Temptation. 1 Corinthians tells us, Paul tells us that even at times of temptation, God is with us. He can help you, He can strengthen you, He can walk with you. Trouble and strife, when you're having trouble, you can expect His presence. When you pass through the waters, when you pass through the fire, I'll be with you when the disciples were in the storm on the boat. Jesus was with them. When you're discouraged, Jesus, Spirit, He said, I'm going, I'm going to send one just like me, the same as me. I'm sending my Spirit. If you're discouraged, the Comforter comes. The Comforter comes. You can experience His comfort. And then even 
even death, even death. Paul tells us that we can be sure to have the presence of God with us. David talks about going through the shadow of the valley of the shadow of death. But Paul talks about to be absent with the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. Come on, put your books for an hour and your notes or whatever you're doing aside for a moment. Let's just, just let that settle on us this morning because God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. There's only one place God won't go uninvited. And that's into our very heart. That's why Revelation talks about him knocking at the door and if anyone hears, opens, he'll come in and have fellowship with us. He'll be with us. Who believes that this morning? And I wonder if there's anyone here this morning, you've never opened the door of your heart and said, Jesus, I want you to come in. I want you to be with me. You need his presence today. God with us. The almighty, omnipotent, all-powerful God that Moses couldn't get to, get to see except for a disappearing hindquarters. And today, you can have him come and dwell in your heart by his spirit. Who wants that this morning? If you've never done that, if you've never invited Jesus, just where you are, say, Russell, I want to invite Jesus into my heart. Just hold your hand up high, say, Jesus, I need you to come into my heart. If you've never done that before, in a moment, yeah, that's, that's awesome, fantastic. You can take your hand down. That's wonderful. Anyone else? Anyone else? Church, would you just pray with me for a moment? Just I want us to all join. This is a beautiful moment for someone who's about to ask Jesus, invite Jesus into their heart. The creator God can come and dwell in your Bible says your body becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit. Come on, pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Would you please come into my heart? Forgive me of my sin. Make all things brand new. I want to know your love and I want to know your presence. Thank you, Jesus. I'm saved. I'm yours. I belong to you. Amen. Father, I pray right now that, Lord, would this, this prayer, that short prayer, would be a life-changing moment. Jesus, as you make yourself real, brand new, a brand new beginning, a brand new life. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, come on, stand your feet. Got our communion. There's no greater place that God displayed his love more than on the cross. Oh, we get so used to talking about the love of God and yeah, yeah, yeah. Friends, I hope it becomes real to you this morning. Just how much God loves you. That he wouldn't even spare his only son. That you could be also a part of his family and experience his love and his goodness in your heart. Come on, we hold the emblem, this little wafer that represents his broken body. Father, we thank you for your broken body. Father, we thank you that your body was broken, that we may become a part of it. We are a part of your body today, the body of Christ. We thank you for it. We thank you that we're a part of you. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's eat together. got the communion the juice represents his shed blood father we know that without the shedding of blood there could be no forgiveness of sin so jesus this morning we thank you that it's paid in full through the finished work of jesus on the cross so with thankful hearts we drink together come on let's drink come on just worship him for a moment